The recent natural gas boom has been really important to the United States and all of North America. In the very recent past, it looked like North America was going to be importing large quantities of gas. And instead, we're awash in gas. Natural gas is abundant and inexpensive in North America. Natural gas use in the United States has increased significantly over the last decade. It recently toppled coal to be our dominant electricity source. This boom has flipped on its head, not just the natural gas landscape, but the energy landscape, and also the entire economy of the United States. Years ago, we anticipated that we would be a net natural gas importer with prices about three or four times what they are today. So the prices have come down, we've become a, a large natural gas producer, uh, and we can utilize those resources across our economy. Now when we think about natural gas, we think about cooking and heating. But natural gas is also a very important petrochemical. We uh, use it uh, to produce hydrogen, Hydrogen is absolutely necessary to reform crude oil. We also use it to produce uh, ammonia fertilizer, and without ammonia fertilizer, there wouldn't be modern agriculture. With some difficulty, we can make methane gas molecules stick together, produce ethylene, and from ethylene, we can produce plastics, petrochemicals. And that's quite frankly what has led to a lot of the renaissance on the demand side in the industrial sector because industrial demand in this country used to be significantly higher than it is today. And we saw you know, some offshoring of industrial process because there were cheaper feedstocks of natural gas available in places like Trinidad, for example. Natural gas prices, unlike oil, uh, tend to vary from geographic regions across the globe. So where we have at one global oil price, natural gas is actually priced by regions. And what you'll see is in Europe, prices tend to be about two times those of the United States. In Asia, they tend to be as much as three times. So you can see the United States has an uh, inherent advantage because of this lower natural gas price. And that's what's gonna fuel your manufacturing renaissance. That's what's gonna fuel your economic growth, is that price that allows the United States to compete. Europe has a significant amount of resource and pipeline infrastructure, but they're a little more reluctant to develop that resource because they're, because they're more concerned about some of the environmental implications. On the flip side, China is anticipated to have a, a, an enormous resource, larger than ours, but they're lacking the infrastructure. But if they put their minds to it, they'll probably build it relatively quickly. I think the, the million dollar question, or trillion dollar or quadrillion dollar question is, can the other countries capitalize on these and how long will it take to capitalize on these? And that question will determine how long the United States enjoys a comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. If we leave the industrial sector, we think about the power sector, they've had tremendous opportunities now to increase their use of natural gas to generate power, while at the same time, there's been economic pressure, as well as pressure from the EPA, uh, to retire coal plants. And coal is a very dirty fuel compared to natural gas. And really that's because natural gas, when it's pulled from the ground, it actually comes up relatively clean. So it's moderately free of sulfur contaminants, nitrogen contaminants, and things like that. Whereas coal comes with it, of course, particulates, sulfur dioxide, or sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides, particularly when it's burned. Natural gas burns much more cleanly. The, the increase of natural gas just recently has shown a corresponding decrease in carbon dioxide. To me, that is incredibly important. That's very significant. But gas doesn't solve our long-term long -term climate equation. We could replace all of the coal with gas, even all of our oil with gas. That still doesn't get us to long-term decarbonization goals. Domestically, we have to even think about internationally as well. As we know, things, everything that has a benefit often has a cost. So th there are undeniable benefits of, of the shale gas revolution, but there are costs. And there's clearly a, a lack of understanding of how big the risks are. It creates real questions on the regulatory regime 
in terms of how much transparency is there? What do we know about that? Who's got responsibility for it? This is a high-end problem to have because these are soluble problems. We can identify where aquifers might be in jeopardy. We can identify the chemicals and the byproducts that are going into and coming out of the ground and address those. But then you also have a lot of these local impacts, such as water quality and noisy trucks and air emissions. And I think those concerns are so important because of how versatile natural gas is as an energy resource and as a part of our economy. Some people are concerned that the shale gas revolution is going to be too successful, that it will increase our dependence on natural gas so much that we'll lose steam on nuclear power as well as on renewables. We're already seeing natural gas take the wind out, out of the sails of wind power and solar energy, uh, as well as making nuclear, new nuclear plants which have new technologies that we'd love to test uneconomic. If natural gas displaces renewables and drives a complacency or a marketplace that doesn't allow us to be as aggressive as we need to be on the renewables that we need to get to, well then shame on us. There is a near-term competition piece of it. Does that present a near-term competitive threat, if I can use that term, to renewables? And, and the answer is, frankly, yes, if you take the short view. But the prudent both investor, as well as regulator, as well as, I would hope, consumer, wants to take a little bit longer view. It's how do I maintain my robust set of options going forward so I'm not overexposed to one technology or another, and I'm, I'm investing in a pathway that gets us toward that longer term system of, of decarbonization that's affordable, reliable, and secure. We really need to think about you know, what's good for the nation, not 10 years out, 20 years out, uh, but also 50 years and 100 years out. A lot of people in the investment community on Wall Street ask the question, what happens if this natural gas boom doesn't pan out like we all are betting that it will? And I think that's a very legitimate question to be asking. I think you would see an increasing shift to renewables, and then you would see a shift back to coal. I think it helps you realize the huge gap that's actually filling in our country, both from an energy standpoint for our concerns on climate change, but also from an economic standpoint, because it's creating this cushion for the economy as it's recovering from the recession. And if that cushion had not been there, there's a lot of open questions about where our economy would be. You know, so there, there's a public debate to be had about this unconventional opportunity that's in front of us. We should all be looking at the same set of facts, working with the universities who are doing studies around what actually is happening to the air, what actually is happening to the water. That's really the, the change. I think it's, it's more of a, how do we do this together? To think about what is the responsible development and use of natural gas in a, in a, in a way that's good economically, good for the environment, good for our security, uh, good for our local environment as well. Through this transparency, society can make an evaluation about both those costs and benefits that are informed by facts, and that enables us as a society to make informed decisions. And those informed decisions allow us to optimize our desired outcomes. So I'm hopeful that when we look at what industry is doing, what the states and the federal government are doing with respect to regulation, with what researchers are doing, I mean, every researcher in the country practically is working on shale gas to try to figure out what the risks really are and how to mitigate them. I think with all this taken together, I'm very hopeful that we can develop shale gas sustainably in this country.